today, and according to Jan, we're not going to be cooking any invasive species. In fact, we're going to be doing something very different. We're going to sit down with Matt Kuchner of Spectrum Effects and get a chance to talk about some of the amazing films that he has worked on, talk about the process and even the state of the industry. This is a real treat for me because I spend most of my life doing production and focusing on the compositing and the visual effects of it, but I've never got the opportunity to actually do some of the practical VFX myself, so. Well, you stay cleaner for sure. I can imagine. It's not that glamorous. It's a very dirty job. I think one of my first experiences with the CGI world was, um, I remember they asked us, could we make some splashes in the water as if somebody was walking on it? And one of the older guys I was working with was like, I hate this computer, this is gonna be computer stuff. It's gonna go away. It's a, Matt, if you wanna deal with it, you deal with it. And he just, he, he didn't, he didn't wanna be bothered with it. And I kinda of get it, you know, he was above all that at that point in his career. He was my age now, probably, or older. And he just didn't wanna deal with some nonsense about making splashes in the water when nobody was walking. So I asked him like, how fast is the guy walking? What's he doing? So we made these little air charges and hooked him up and doom, doom, doom. So we made these splashes and he goes, well, I think he's walking too fast or not. So we, I kept timing him until we got just the splashes right. I think the movie was Cool World. I thought, man, it's the neatest thing. Like my boss was telling me it's gonna take away a job and I spent two days making splashes. I don't know, I like it. <laughs> so I always embraced it. I thought it was a really cool new thing. And it makes us look fantastic, the complimentary sides of that you know to be able to keep cables and other stuff in the shot and have it be erased it's magic people have no idea what we did was that the moment that you knew this is what you're going to be doing you know i don't know that if i ever knew the moment i think i just even though i've been doing a little over 30 years now i think i just recently became comfortable with knowing that's what I'm gonna do. I had no family in it, I didn't have anything in it. I just had to go to work every day and keep figuring it out. And I think I've always been so nervous that it was gonna be my last job. Even after awards and everything, I just thought, oh man, it could be my last job still. And I love doing it so much, I just, um, I don't think I was comfortable realizing it was my career probably till even, I was probably doing it 25 years, 24 years. I always define success as, you know, where you meet at the crossroads of something that you're really good at and something that you're passionate about. Yes, you're very fortunate to do something that you're passionate about, that you love and you could make money at. You're, it's completely fortunate. I also think, as you just said a minute ago, the American dream, you know, before the camera's running. I think, I think that dream means to go to work. Yeah. At least it did for me. If uh, you don't, if you're not gonna make, money doing something you love to do something but go to work every day you know and that's really helped me at least financially at the end i've never been bored that really is uh i think the what makes america great the fact that you can wake up one day come up with an idea and and do it yes and I don't know that you'll reap everything you put into it. You could give 100% to it. It could mm -hmm. just been a shitty idea. Yeah. You know, the dream doesn't mean every idea you have is great or a great idea has to work. It does mean if you don't give up and you keep going every day, you're likely to do okay. But if you don't do anything, you're likely to get nothing. I think by doing nothing is, is, is the worst kind of failure both emotionally and then financially. I've never really looked at money as, as wealth. I've looked at it as time. I felt like money was freedom. It was never like, I don't know, you, yes, money could buy the watch or money could buy a cool mm -hmm. car or money could buy that. But really what money was to me was freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom to not have the anxiety of where I'm gonna eat freedom to not have the anxiety of how to pay your bills or freedom to just go, I wanna go there today and get on a plane or a car and go and do it. So money is always equated to freedom to me mathematically. And now more than ever, and especially in the days we live in now, the world of COVID, 
It used to be, uh, I tried to tell my kids, you know, you guys have never been through a writer's strike or a director's strike or a teamster strike, so you don't know what it's like to be out of work for six or seven months and you can't buy a job. Because they've really seen the unbelievable, humbled success that we've achieved, one show after another. You know, now we're set up to where we could do multiple TV shows and features at the same time, which is fantastic, right? Yeah. So they see all that and they grew up in that. And when I tell them about a writer's strike or a director's strike, they're like, to, they, for maybe one second, try to sympathize with it, but um, it's just another story dad's yeah. telling and I gotta go. <laughs> Speaking of action, what do you actually do? I think we make people look like heroes. We make them look legendary. We make them look sexy. You know, we crash cars, we blow them up. We, we're basically the part of the movie that ends up in the trailer. You know, we're the action. Movie. The good part. Yeah. Depends on what kind of movies you like. Well, most films, you know, you can actually pretty much get a summary of what's going to happen and get a highlight reel all at the same time. And in a world where everybody just reads headlines, I think a trailer is more powerful than the film at times. Yes. And I love the, the way the editors do the trailers. Yeah. You know, I found that when I first started, probably in the late 80s, when I would see the trailers, I didn't know what the movie was about. I just thought it was cool. Yeah. And now I find when I watch the trailer, like I, I see it all. I'm not sure I want to watch the movie after the trailer. No, Somebody like how does it live up to it? Yeah. Like I watched the trailer from Unhinged, the last Russell Crowe thing. As a matter of fact, I think it's, it might be coming out now or something. Mm -hmm. Well, when we did that, a couple great beats of action. Mm -hmm. And now I watch the trailer and I'm like, <laughs> Holy shit. I mean, the trailer looks fantastic. And I hope the movie lives up to it because the trailer looks just great. I've never been a good judge of that. I read a <laughs> script, even when I'm doing the movie. I don't know. I mean, when I did Tombstone, I read the first thing. I'm like, it was a love story. Tombstone, a love story. It was like a love story. And then after, you know, they fired the director and a couple ADs and producers and people later, it became an action movie. One of the greatest Westerns of all time. I was like, who's gonna give a shit about mm -hmm. Wyatt Earp? Yeah. But then filming it, you're like, wow. Yeah. I'm in the middle of like, I still can't believe today that I gotta do that movie. You did some pretty great ones. I mean, holy shit, yeah. Tombstone. Yeah, Tombstone was legendary. Yeah, it had, it had, for me, from the effects world, it had everything. I mean, it had uh, bullet hits, obviously. Of course. But it had everything like when the steam train pulled up. It wasn't smoke, it's steam. And it wasn't right? over the top. It was, it was no. a period piece. Yes. You had the opportunity to really try to recreate something real. Yes. The way the dust blew down the streets, yep. the way the tumbleweed would go, the way, you know, their mustache or their hair would blow just right. Um, and then, of course, like, then you realize you're doing a movie. If you've watched it, there's a rain sequence. And it's probably the, mo the worst rain I've ever made. Like on a scale of one to 10 bad, it's a 12 bad. And that was the first time I experienced a director um, arguing with a producer. And uh, he wanted rain, the producers didn't. Mm -hmm. So they agreed that it would be a crane shot in, in you know, the, these uh, Kurt Russell's beautiful blue eyes, right tight close, pull away, look straight down, there's rain and he's looking up, you know, like to God yep. and that's the shot. So they said, Matt, you make rain in a circle and you keep it, you do not do it down the streets. We are not doing that much rain. We are not approving it. <laughs> and at that point, so many people have been fired off that movie and I wanted my job so bad, but that's about all I could do. And I watched that crane come up from, this, from those big blue eyes. And as it's coming up, it looked all the way down the street before it went over. And they kept rehearsing that. And I had to go to the DP, Bill Fraker, who's, you know, oh my God, like the best DP who ever lived maybe, and explain to him, I, I don't have rain down there, sir. I don't have it. <laughs> and he goes, well, you better make it. I mean, we had hoses straight up in the air, just <laughs> winging it, trying to get any water in the back. But you watch that movie now and it's right in his eyes and it's raining. And then it kind of looks up and it's still, it's, it's, it's raining and it's really good. But he comes up so high that if you actually watch it, there's a circle of rain and not a <laughs> fucking drop outside that circle. 
<laughs> and those producers in the end, rather than doing any CGI, even back then, they could have helped me. They could have helped themselves, but they decided against it. Out of all the cool things in that movie, that rain was awful. Towards the end of that movie, the director calls me over and says, they're going to come out of a church. They're going to get married and it's going to be snowing. And we're in Arizona. It's like 112 degrees. There's like, there's a fat chance of it snowing for real. I'm like, sir, how much snow do you want? The whole shot. There's your church. And he had a very thick Greek accent. Okay. And as he walked away, the producers run over. What did he say? He said, it's snowing. How much? He said, the whole shot. And they looked at me. I said, now, you know what we went through with the rain? <laughs> it's up to you. But it was pretty embarrassing for me. And they all walked away and talked. It was a Friday evening at Rap, So it was like really Saturday morning at maybe, what, 6 a.m. was Rap, you know, from the Friday to Saturday. He said, cut your make it snow Monday. We're in the middle of a desert. We don't have any product. <laughs> We started shuttling snow in trucks with all the products from Creative Effects. And oh my God, the trucks that left Los Angeles and drove seven hours straight to get us the stuff by Monday to make snow. That's actually in the movie. And it's actually snowing in every part that they pointed wow. a camera at, thank God. So we got through the snow, but we, we got embarrassed pretty good on the rain. I think if the public knew the actual things that have happened to us yeah. you know as a crew behind the scenes if they saw some of the things we saw when we're filming some of the things we saw editorially and then you see the final product and went why did they choose that or how did that happen one of my favorite directors and probably one that i spent the most time with in the past i guess seven years now is peter berg and he's i feel blessed to have met him I mean, we clicked, man. I really love that cat. And he's, he wants it in the lens. He wants it real and gnarly. And uh, I mean, he wants it safe. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But he wants it. And he'll, he'll, he'll make it happen. He'll help push for it. And his movies prove it from um, Mile 22. That's, we just did Spencer Confidential for Netflix, oh, right? cool. Yeah. I that, love that film. That came out pretty good. That was great. Uh, Patriot's Day. I loved doing that movie with him. That was fantastic. It was a great film. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, Deepwater Horizon. It really shows his, you know, his, his rage. And he always has to tell some story that was like real. You know, Patriot's Day was real. Deepwater Horizon was real. They're real stories. Yeah. They're great stories. Um, I think uh, a lot of people take action films for granted sometimes. They, just think it's pure action. But when you have a combination of great storytelling, great practical, and great CGI, all of those things disappear. It becomes an experience. I remember yeah. in 99, the first time I watched The Matrix, I, yeah, the, the visual effects were, of course, they, they blew me away. They blew everybody away. But the story was so coherent that even if you look at, at it back today, it still feels it holds as water. edge as it yeah. was back then. Yeah, it holds water. Yeah. And I do think you said something that the audiences are more sophisticated. Absolutely. Absolutely. You could, you could feel it while you're watching it with them. I was mesmerized watching Weta on a Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Like to be able to do that with them and to get nominated with the awards with them and stuff. That was huge. To watch a hundred witness cameras go up on these sets, a hundred witness cameras. So I loved working with Weta and I knew we were on to yeah. something together. And it was such a treacherous movie to film. It was so treacherous. Like, Where'd you film it? Uh, almost all in Louisiana. We had an opening sequence in Vancouver for just a minute or two. We had, we built San Francisco. We did everything in New Orleans. And then we went to San Francisco for like two days. Wow. So the, and basically 96% of the movie was New Orleans. Wow. With the rebate there, it's easier just to shoot there. So we built San Francisco on Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and shot it in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. The next time I built San Francisco was in Australia for San Andreas. And I keep thinking to myself, are we ever going to use San Francisco for San Francisco? Nah, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. Yeah, yeah. Never happened. Not going to happen. No. It would be nice, though, to be it able to be. go. 
it's beautiful. <laughs> it's a great place to do it. Yeah. And you don't have to fake anything in San Francisco. Right. But between permits and yeah. no rebates and whatever it is, somehow it's easier to go all it's, the way yeah, to Australia. It's much easier to go halfway across the world and do yeah, business. Yeah, absolutely. Where you live. So your kids are in this. They are. They are indeed. They, uh, they both have coordinated shows. My oldest has uh, been nominated for awards now, and he got into the VES. Awesome. So he's in the Visual Effects Society. And we got a letter saying um, they think we're the first father and son inductees, which that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That made some tears for sure. Oh, yeah. So we might there. Maybe we'll hit a. Uh, we'll do a trifecta. I mean, the little one's coordinating. He did, he did uh, his first couple shows now. And if I don't kill him, maybe he'll make it. <laughs> that must be great, though, to be able to pass on your skills and then to watch your kids actually excel at what you did. Oh yeah. Have you reached that point yet? Have you seen them do things oh, that? Fuck yes! It's just been. It's been the one of the if not the greatest thing in my life to watch, right? Like, you see, um, you know, you've watched them do all these nincompoop things or do great things in first grade, second grade, this, that, and the other. Now you're watching them on set, talk to the director, talk to the producer, working with the actor. And they're just so much better than I am. They're just, for their age where they're at, they're just so much better. They, the way they present themselves, the way they talk, at their age, I, I I had to buy a Hewlett Packard one gig <laughs> hard drive, like 286 or something, oh, yeah. and it had spell check, right? So I bought it to try to figure out how to type um, an invoice. And here's these kids at the same age running the world. It's now fantastic. I, I see my kids play on a phone and the amount of power and the amount of comprehension of how to wield that power at their age is truly really It's remarkable. amazing. Yeah, it's cool. I think. Um, I try to have the conversation with them, and I do think now they're getting it. Like, we have all this equipment and all these, you know, mold mold making and three D printing and plasma cutters and trailers and equipment. And like I told them, I, I got I got us here. But now you could take all that. You don't have to amass all that anymore. The mm -hmm. properties and the all that equipment, it's all here. It's paid for. So you get to just take your imagination from now at your age at 27, 24, 28 years old, take all that imagination and focus it and move forward doing the baddest shit in the world. Wow. And I think that is amazing to me because they have most of what they need. I mean, to, to them, they still want the new and latest, whatever it is, like we all do, but they have a great starting point. They don't have to get the first trailer to go to set no, with it, right? No. So they get a start from like level 10. I think I'm more excited for that than they are just to see how far they take it. Yeah. Because it's exponential, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it took 30 some odd years to get there. Absolutely. So now they get to pick it up and, and, and cruise with it. And they're both different enough. They have similarities, but they're both different enough that they complement each other. They might not see it all the time, but they complement each other really well. One's strength is the other one's weakness and vice versa. That's excellent. Makes Fantastic. A Especially since, you know, a team is what makes this work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I love uh, just kind of stepping back and watching them, watching them deal with it. I learn. I watch them going, holy shit, that's a cool way to do it. You know, I like that. And there's other times you go, uh, you, you can't do that. Why? You're... <laughs> Got to end up missing that hand if you do that. That's <laughs> nah, not going to work. You could try it, but I recommend highly against it. And I think now they listen to that. I'm sure they've uh, heard enough stories of you learning about it the hard way. They have indeed. And now they they don't get the stories from me. They get it from other peers. You know, everybody's always looking to tell that story about you, right? <laughs> so, yep, it's good though. What's the biggest challenge you have in the taken on yet that you simply have to holy cow i don't know i think actually it's probably something you wouldn't expect it's learning how to slow down i think my biggest challenge is, is learning how to be comfortable and relax and enjoy some of the i guess the simplicity of the fruits of the success so to me that's my biggest challenge because i have no idea how to do that 
So when my wife says, uh, why don't you relax a little bit? I have no idea what that means. I just, I don't get it. Yeah. You know, you're 5 a.m. in the gym or you're waking up at different hours to do business in different countries. You're running, you know, we got three different divisions of our company from government contracts to the movie industry to, we're fortunate. So for me, I think the biggest challenge is gonna be how to slow down and enjoy some of it and to learn how to hand it over eloquently. You yeah, know? how not to jump the shark. That's important. Yeah, no doubt, right? Yeah. You don't want to be Arthur Fonzarelli no, all the time, not. do you? No. That's funny. The wife and I say that when we're watching a show. When I first said it, she's like, okay, what? What is this shark, the stupid thing you talk about? So I explained <laughs> it to her. And now she tells me we were watching Hannibal, the TV uh -huh. series. And she goes, this show jumped the shark. I'm like, it did the last episode for me. She goes, what's up with the moose thing? And it was great because she used it at the perfect time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be figuring out what the, what the next half of my life is. You know, not that I'm going to stop this in any way. But, yeah, just figuring out what's next. Do you ever dabble in film again? You know, I, I, no. Whoever's watching this, they, they had something called film. It's really weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it didn't use little chips. No. This thing called a negative, and it went made these sounds in a, in a camera. It, when, when your camera made that sound, it was actually working. The idea of something being digital was n not even a thought. At least it wasn't mm -hmm. when I started. And then when I heard that we were gonna, you know, we're gonna do a digital camera work. And I remember being, I think the first time where I saw it really attempted was a movie called Crank. There was a lot of CGI before that. There's a lot of little yeah. digital, but Crank was, we're gonna use these cameras in an action movie under real circumstances. Yeah. And Mark and Brian were the directors, and one of them, uh, if not both of them, were uh, hockey players. Mm -hmm. So they were really good on rollerblades. And they made a backpack for one of them and to hold the camera with the other, and they were gonna rollerblade through these sequences, mm -hmm. and how can they get the backpack down enough to get all these things? And man, you'd watch these kids go for it, and I thought, that is so impractical, all this crap they're dragging around with them. If they just got <laughs> an IMO and a good lens and they could have yeah. been done by now and they keep dragging these cables and one guy turns right and the other guy goes left and they rip mm -hmm. another cable and we're stopping down for batteries. And But they wanted the technology. They wanted to yeah. do it and they were going to do it. And um, now I'm the guy that goes, uh, hey, uh, I love it, right? Because the batteries hardly ever were out. The chips don't give a yep. shit. Some kid called the data manager kid is running around. And the director's over there and the DP's in his tent. So they don't even sit together anymore. It's like two different worlds. It's interesting. I think some people would say it's so much easier. I don't know. Um, we talked about Tombstone. There was no playback. No. We went to a tent at lunch and they ran a chem. And you went back and forth mm -hmm. and the uh, one of the editor's assistants, when they asked for another role, would take the next one together and you'd run it through. And there's a beautiful little mm -hmm. screen this big and oh, yeah. we'd all try to take <laughs> turns. And of course, I was so low on the totem pole, it meant when they all stepped away, I go, can you please just do that one more time through that shootout sequence? And, you know, they acted like I wasn't there and moved forward. So you start off with that to now. If they didn't have playback, they couldn't do a movie. No, now you have digital dailies, you have servers on set, everybody has an iPad Absolutely. that's secure that can view, mark it up, and it's amazing. But I think in some ways, technology does great things. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways, it, it, it takes away from some of the fundamental things that worked. We would all go to dailies at lunch. And we would, mm -hmm. you know, you grab some food, you go to dailies and you'd watch your fuck ups. Yeah. And you had to watch them the people that were going to hire and fire you. And you had to watch them with people that were very serious about what was going on. And it was, it was their whole life was that movie, Cliffhanger or Tombstone or whatever it was, right? Now you log on to Pix or whatever the 
the studio says is their most secure thing in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And you give some 12 year old all these codes and he calls you back and you sit at home and you watch dailies. Yeah. And you sit there where you get to critique yourself or not or whatever that is. And mm -hmm. there was something super accountable when dailies were shown in that lunch, wherever we had to go for lunch, or you had to go for the weekend, everybody else went out, but a department head, you went and watched dailies, you know, on Saturday after you wrapped, yeah. you know, a 90 hour week. Now you go home and you watch it in the car while your driver drives you. Yeah, I find that also in uh, the world of editing or post, the apprenticeship is also pretty much non-existent. So that interaction, really? that criticism is getting lost. As a young editor, to really learn, you're not going to sit with a master for 10 right. years and learn the craft. Um, there's um, an emphasis on not having patience to succeed in the industry. Hmm. And I think a big part of the apprenticeship that was there before doesn't exist. I think it's rare for somebody coming out of school to have a, a meaningful internship that will land an apprenticeship where they could truly work with an editor. Absolutely. That's just not our industry, though. I think that has something to do even more with the financial uh, observations that the young people have. I think it sounds like you and I were similar to where we, we didn't believe we were owed anything. We had to go figure it out and learn it and become valuable. And I'm generalizing by saying, I feel now, it could just be an old guy talking about kids or it could be the truth. But either way, I feel that somehow I'm watching that the, the kids that were our age are more entitled. Sure. They feel more entitled. Like mm -hmm. at 16, 18, 20, I, uh, I don't know, to have a mentor was all it was all of the things in the world. Right. Or, yeah. you know, when I came into this business to have a, a guy who. No, 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 here's how you do it. Man, it almost brings tears to my eyes. Are you kidding me? This guy stopped to teach me something. I mean, he stopped what he was doing to show me that. Mm -hmm. And if he did that enough, I'm gonna make money and have fun doing that like he's doing. Now I find, uh, how much do I make an hour? Um, uh, well, it's union scale. Well, they, they say you get 10% more. I, I, I don't know. Look, hey, man, I was probably in this business seven years or longer before I even thought about anything like that. I still couldn't believe they would hire me to do what I was <laughs> doing. I can't believe it today. Let you alone were a pioneer. That. You really were. You know, um, I back when it wasn't just a job you got into for money. It no. wasn't even a job for you. It was something that just became your calling. It, it was. I grew up in my dad's shops. Um, uh, he had mechanic shops and fabrication shops. So I didn't go to school much. And uh, so there was kind of like an unwritten thing. If I didn't want to go to school, I had to go to the shop. Mm -hmm. So I, eighth grade was the last. Uh, I didn't complete all of eighth grade. <laughs> so I ended up in the shop a lot. One of my dad's business partners took a liking to me, thank God. And uh, he educated me in the shops with stuff I found interesting. How to tune up a car, how to take apart a front end, how to do brakes, all that was fun for me. Mm -hmm. I loved it. So I'd read the books about how to do it and the part numbers and how to, because it interested me. So I loved it. I think I, he was showing me that there's something else to learn because he knew I wasn't going back to school, I hated it. That shop was in Reseda, California. And there's four corners, like in every crossroads. And on one corner was a company called Carriage Craft. Mm -hmm. And on another company was Mike's Transmission. And my dad's shop was D&B All Wheel Alignment. And there was uh, Reseda Auto Body or something. Carriage Craft means nothing. Unless today you call Carriage Craft uh, cinema picture vehicles. And the same person that owned Carriage Craft then mm -hmm. owns cinema picture vehicles today, which is a multi, multi-million dollar corporation that... If there's a car in a movie today, it's highly likely somehow they touched it. And um, back then they did cars. So catty corner from my dad's shop, like uh, 
A-Team and Hardcastle and McCormick and the kit car and uh, uh, the Fall Guy truck oh, yeah. and the Chips motorcycles. And that's where they all got done. Yeah. So as a, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth grader, um, I'd finish at my dad's shop by like four or five every night, finish mopping the floor and I'd race over to the next shop. And, uh, you know, they, man, I can make 50 bucks a night finishing welding a roll cage. Are you kidding? What are you, 15 years old? So I made some money in my dad's shop that day and picked up 50 bucks or 100 bucks on a Saturday. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit. So I saw the kind of money that it was making. And, you know, I had no idea back then. I felt like, well, maybe they're right. If you don't go to school, you're going to be a failure. I had no idea I was making more than my teachers at 15. No clue they didn't pay teachers any money. I had no clue what anybody made. I just know that I, I got myself a little apartment, a little Toyota pickup, and things were going pretty good. I didn't need a driver's license, though. I got that eventually. We had to work for it. Yeah. I think the um, overabundance of information, uh, Google, you can find everything online, right? Leads to an underappreciation of real knowledge. I love that. It's the best explanation I've heard. I could search for probably everything that my heart desires. And I could see that someone knows how to do it. Right. And it can give me that full sense of security that I know how to do it because someone else did. Well, yeah, you YouTube it. Yeah. I YouTube everything. Taught me to do a lot of cool shit. Yeah. Learned how to run half this boat on YouTube. How do you, what happens if you need to program this or program that? I type in the charts or the plotters and it's all right there. It's fantastic. My sons are done with my stories. There's no question. They, they were probably done with it by the time they were four years old. But we were talking about something and I told them, you guys get your call sheets every night on your uh, phones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have a phone, how would you get your call sheet? Uh, I don't know, dad on our computer? If you didn't have a computer, how would you get your call sheet? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I go, how about the night before they handed it to you? Or the night before you had to go to the production office and pick one up? Why? Um, when I started, they didn't have cell phones. We certainly didn't have computers. You had to figure out a way to communicate. Um, how about a roll of dimes you kept in your car and you went to a payphone to call the production office? Payphone? Yes, dimes. Dimes went into a payphone. You mean like a pay card? No, it was on the side of the road, man. It was called a pay phone. You put it in, you lost your dime, you got just irritated. Because I only remember quarters. Do you? Yeah, actually, <laughs> I clearly remember dimes. That's where that saying came from drop the dime. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But they, I had to like Google what it was and show them what I was talking about. And I go, but then it got cool, man. I got a pager. And I was big time. I was big money with my pager. Because then I oh, got yeah. a phone number and somebody to call. Now I could pull over and just call the person on my pager. With the opportunity, to access all of this information and with enough free brain cells that they'll require you to memorize it all. It can get um, all kinds of breakthroughs and Absolutely. things we haven't even thought of yet. Yeah. Yeah. And there's in, in, in the creative camera work that I've been able to see because of the technology, how small something's gotten, how mm -hmm. compact, how clear it is. Yeah. There's going to be some cool shit for sure, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's going to, it's going to come from these young kids yeah. and some kind of new iPhone, I'm sure. I, I watch TikTok like crazy now because you, can't, you? you can't avoid it. Okay. I don't have TikTok. <laughs> TikTok is so innovative because you have these young filmmakers throwing phones into washing machines, uh, tying them to the spokes of a bicycle wheel. They're doing all kinds of crazy things that you would never That's do with great. a camera. But because of the limiting factor of it being 15 seconds and some of the creative decisions taken away from them because they're typically remixing to a pre-existing song that's there they're limited to focus their imagination purely on how they recreate that moment. I have yet to download TikTok. I try to wait because I get overwhelmed. 
Yeah. You know, like, like the Instagram and my sons run that for me. The, the web pages, the Instagrams and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I've gotten into the Instagram now. I like it. And I could find an hour go by, like just watching dumb video. And some of the drones now. Wow. They, I mean, they're cinematic marvels like the Skydio 2.0. It's incredible. That thing, it's a, a cinema genius that maps a 3D world and picks the best possible camera. Yeah, but I mean, you just went even techier than most. They could take a Mavic at 4K. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I mean, holy I, shit. I uh, lost mine in the Gulf Coast on the last job. I decided that I was um, going to fly my little Mavic Air off a speeding boat. You took off off the boat yeah. while it was underway? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, that worked out. It worked out before. I've done it before. I have great video to prove it. This time, not so much. It didn't clear the boat. It almost cleared it. Not quite. I, I, I don't even know how many drones I've destroyed. <laughs> you know, we had a chance though. How about this? On, um, so I've crashed a bunch of them. Yeah. And uh, my son and I, we get a call to do uh, The Hunt, the movie The Hunt that just came out, right? I was really surprised. I actually enjoyed that film. I was surprised I enjoyed it as I, well. We shot it. My son coordinated it, my oldest. Yeah. And uh, Steve Mullen yeah. uh, was the producer on that. To see, I worked for his dad. And, I, and Steve was even older than me, uh, uh, Jerry Mullen, his father, and, and, and Steve Mullen's his son. And Steve has like, probably got at least 10 years on me. And to see my son work for him, that's cool shit. But in the scripts, they have, uh, he says, Dad, the drone flies in and they shoot at it and it blows up. <laughs> I'm like, we finally got to get paid to destroy a drone? I love it. But it was complex because to put explosives... Mm on a drone and then fly the drone and then trigger the explosive at the right time. It was, it was a bit nerve wracking. That's quite a bit of testing at the shop. You know, a lot of frequencies, a lot of, it seems so easy. We just fly the drone and in the movie you fly it and the guy shoots at it. But really what it is is we put explosives on it. We're flying it and we trigger the explosives and blow it apart and take it apart in a way where it fell straight down and didn't go zinging off into camera. I think we're still young enough, you and I, that we're going to see we were born at a great time. Yeah. We're going to see a full swing of technology. We were born in the analog age. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what we're going to see digital blow our minds. I mean, there's still people that were born, I guess they're about ending their lives, but before cars, right? Right. And uh, they saw the man on the moon, and now they're seeing more technology in the watch they're wearing. Absolutely. I mean, this thing, it's... I mean, I have the Series 3, it's pretty old by today's standards, but it still has more computing power than I'm sure my first computer did. You remember the Casio calculator watch? Oh, yeah. I remember walking in a mall, I don't know how old I was, and I looked at that watch and thought, that's what the rich people wear. The rich people get a calculator on their watch. And I stared at it and stared at it and thought, man, I'm going to buy that one day. You know, I had no idea how much it cost or what money was worth. And I didn't, I mean, maybe I don't even know what it costs now. <laughs> but I looked at that watch like, wow. Yeah. Holy shit. A calculator. Or on Deep Space Nine, they paid you to make uh, whatever those trans... Tricorders? Yeah, yeah, they paid us yeah. to come up with different ways to figure that out. Now you'd hand them an Apple phone. It's, it's amazing because... It's actually exceeded what a tricorder could do in many ways. If you think of where the technology is, we have already become cyborgs with that device. No, so I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty. I'm of guilty it. of it. I run my whole company out of it. Yeah. I have to have two of them. I keep a backup and I clone it. I've been fortunate. I've done a lot of cool Wahlberg pictures, you know. I'm and, and a, such a huge Wahlberg fan. Such a good dude, man. And, uh, I was waiting on a on an important call, like what we're going to do with the picture. Are we going to Indonesia? Are we back to uh, Atlanta? Where are we going? What are we doing? And I got it was my older boat, my old boat. And I was getting on the boat, and it was in my pocket. And somehow, when I got on the boat, the phone flipped out and went in the water, and I hear it splash. You got to be kidding! It's in the water. <laughs> So I went and grabbed my mask and snorkel and a hookah so I could go down. And as I go down, it was John Logan Pearson. His number comes up and I'm like, there's no way this is actually happening to me. He, and I didn't see it because it's so dark and murky, right? Like this is a shithole to dive in. 
and it, it came on. I was like, oh, thank God somebody called. Oh, shit, it's them. <laughs> and I did all I could to get out of the water as fast as I could. It's ringing. And, of course, I get out, and it stops ringing, and the phone dies. <laughs> like, what the fuck am I going to do? How do I call him back? So I, I go upstairs, and I go, honey, I need your phone. Why? I got to call John. She's like, I don't have his number. Oh, shit. So we had to, I had to get on my laptop, get his number, yep. pick, get her phone. Of course, she doesn't answer her number because she doesn't know it's her. Yeah. And then finally, when we get it all sorted out, it's like, yeah. uh, hey, he goes, oh, I just want to let you know. Maybe we give a chat tomorrow morning. I got it. I'm like, about a chat tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah. Our lives have changed. Yeah, technology is um, definitely shaping how we do this moving forward. I can't wait to see how we're going to solve some yeah. challenges or how we're actually going to even go back to doing the things we did just months ago. With so much changing now, I'm sure technology is going to play a pivotal role in how we go back to the set and what we do. Yes. Um I, I still pretend to know nothing about this COVID disease, right? I don't know who does actually. No, I don't think anybody knows anything about it. But uh, we were, uh, we had seven shows filming, five television shows, series, and two features. One of the features was just about getting ready to wrap, and we had two more starting. So we would have had like nine, but then eight, and worked through Christmas. So we, we booked quite a bit of advance. We're very mm -hmm. blessed. COVID hits, uh, 52 or 54 guys were on our roster. We went from 54 to like six to zero. That happened in about 12 days, mm -hmm. maybe. And I was sitting there going, look, it's gonna come, you know, like everybody else, we're gonna be back to work in the next mm -hmm. month or so. What do we got? What, so I, I come up with, let's, let's, let's make some hand washing trailers. Well, there's a sink and a thing and a paper towel. We're going to wash our hands. So we build these trailers. And I thought that, I don't know what else is going to happen, but we're going to have to wash our hands. It mm -hmm. seems like that. Coming from a guy that works in crap all the time, I haven't been the best at that. So I thought it was ironic that that's the direction I figured mm -hmm. it just made so much sense. Just wash your hands. Cut to today, just before you came in, mm -hmm. I was talking with a producer down. We got a bunch of these trailers and a lot of them are rented and they're on shows, but somehow we've become the hub, if you will, as like, uh, there's a, a television series called, I think it's Servant. Servant, maybe? I don't know. They're in season two. They're in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. It might be an Apple thing or something. So those producers have producing so much. Yeah. So they have like, they want three trailers, one trailer for set, one trailer for base cap. And the other trailer I'm learning is so that the construction, uh, while they're doing their stuff, they bring their tools and equipment out. Everybody washes their hands. The cleaning crew cleans it, hands it to the next construction department who does the outside work. Hmm. So they don't, they don't need any more. And, uh, a second production, not in Philadelphia, one in Atlanta was describing something similar. So now I'm on the phone with producers I've known literally now half my life, and they're going, so Kutcher, what's up with the COVID stuff? You know, how, how is the trailers going like? So I'm telling them what I just told you. And they're going, man, that's great. You know, you're a good source of knowledge for this. And I thought to myself, holy shit. Mm. You know, like, I, they're not asking me about effects today. They're, I mean, we're literally talking about protocol wow. for COVID. It's a trip. It's a trip. We had no creative conversation. I mean, a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, won awards, fucking love what I do. Today I'm talking about washing hands. And can we store face protection? in the trailers. Hmm. Not a creative moment in the whole conversation. I've heard a lot of scenarios. I've heard, um, and this, this one I've heard multiple times, that there's going to be, and they, and they related to this, we did a television series called, called Preacher. It was nuts, right? The guy that blew off his yeah. face with a shotgun Absolutely. and his girlfriend, and you know, is he heaven or hell? And whatever it was, and, and, and the writers were insane. And every, I would look forward to getting the scripts because 
I had no idea what the fuck was coming next. You thought you might, but you had no clue. And, um, but the way we got so much done on that was there was main unit, second unit. There could be a third unit. Fuck, there could be four units filming that week. And uh, they got a lot in the can. So kind of what I'm hearing now is uh, uh, we're, we're, we're doing The Walking Dead this year. Oh, and we've uh, we've my, been one in, of my favorite shows. We've been invited to do uh, hang I'm out. I'm volunteering with them. to do your behind the scenes for that. Dude, you'd love it. My my <laughs> oldest is going to coordinate it, and uh, the producer on it, somebody we've been with now for quite some time, Joe and Capera, and he's running what they call the Walking Dead Universe. We just committed through spring of 2022 is the contract we signed, so we're going to be there a while. Talking with them, he's like Matt. You remember the way we did a horror story? We had two units. And you remember when Preacher, like when you were on that, you had three or four units? That's what we're planning. We're so far behind. Mm -hmm. We're so far behind that it's going to be something like that. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that from multiple producers. Three or four smaller units rather than the bigger unit. And they're going to they're gonna get to work. Are you a big fan of The Walking Dead? Truthfully, I've never, I've never watched an episode. That's not true. They sent me a bunch that I had to watch. I'll watch them eventually. It's it's actually kind of good. I, I got really drawn into it. I'm even watching the spinoff, Fear of the really? Walking Dead. I think they're, they're great. Um, the production value has gone down from you hear the, that? the beginning. So, we need better effects. Yes. In general, the yes. story's great, but the production value has yes. suffered. Uh, well, hopefully we'll personally fix that for you. Yes, I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm, I'm truly excited now to see how... You know, I don't know that they don't... Look, I don't know them that well, yeah. but I do know Joe. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, they're making a lot of changes in personnel mm -hmm. in, in many departments. And uh, they are... Th I, I can tell you this, they, they're not skimping. They want to get it done, quite frankly. I don't know what they've done up until now, but I know mm -hmm. what the meetings that I've taken... They're they're up in their ante for sure, and 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 they talk about it. So, um, hopefully the 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 audience, the diehard audience for that, will get a treat. I hope we all get to go back to work soon. Yes. So, there's some good plans. There's some good. Co I think there's. You said it. It's not going to be the same. No. And that's for sure. And that's um, not necessarily a bad thing. No, I, I personally enjoy change. Mm -hmm. I like being rocked off my center a little bit and moving Changes in different directions. Absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't, it goes for every aspect mm -hmm. of my life. I call it the bomb dropping. <laughs> you know, if the, and, and I guess, I don't know, maybe it's the Jewish guilt thing or something, but if, uh, if there's too long in between dropping bombs, I, 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 that's when I freak out. Uh, if yeah. things are too good for too long, I get anxiety, right? Because I, I know what to do when the bomb drops. Yeah. You you move forward. You figure it out. You solve the problem. You persevere. Right. But when there's no bomb dropping, I'm not exactly sure what to do. When everything's yeah. good, my wife tries to explain to me that uh, it, it, it's okay if nothing's going wrong. I go, I know, That's but then it's building. It's building. It's like an earthquake, right? Yeah. It's uh, if we just have little tremors and then you know a little bit of a bang every yeah. once in a while, you're okay. But if it's if there's been no tremors and there's been no real earthquakes for a while, yeah, you know the next earthquake. You know it's be coming because uh, if you had a nice summer, not too hot, just perfect, not too many thunderstorms, you know you're gonna get killed that winter. Yeah, winter is coming and you're not gonna be happy. We are truly blessed in this country for the most part, to be able to publicly discuss, film, present our own opinions, right, wrong, or indifferent. And uh, to see some of these other countries gain those rights over time. Like I filmed a few times in Hungary, in Hungary. And you look at some of their studios are uh, 70 years old. They got some of the largest studios in, in, in the world now in Hungary. Wow, some of the that. best crews in the world, actually. Fantastic fabricators. And when you're talking to them, um, 
One of them was telling me when I was born and then I became, you know, I went to school to become an engineer and then I was an engineer, but now uh, uh, that they're no longer in a blocked country, uh, he does movies and he's such a fantastic fabricator. And I, well, how'd you get in? He goes, I just told you, the government. And what do you mean? He goes, I didn't have a choice. You, you're an engineer, you're an Olympic swimmer, you're a runner, you're, they told you, they told me what I was going to be. No shit. Like, wow. And now he works in film and he's fucking great at it. But what a trip where you're filming across the street from the Museum of Terror. Wow. And when you go to see the Museum of Terror about the Holocaust and, and uh, the reality of all that, you realize the Danube River in the picture is changed color, but because of the blood in it. And yet it's right there where we're filming. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a fantastic industry. It is. It's mind blowing. It is. I guess it, I, I guess, yes, Hollywood started here for sure. But when, when you look at it globally, it says bigger, bigger everywhere else. Look at India. You ever shot in India? Oh my God. What an industry. Fuck. I, 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 I love shooting there. I do. I hate to admit how much I love it, but I love it. The people will do anything to get the shot. Their passion is, it's fucking amazing. It's so cool. Film is such a big part of their culture there. Check this out. I, I, I'll, give, I'll give an example. They want to do this big water sequence similar to like um, San Andreas or, or Dawn Trader, one of those things we did. They want a big boat and this whole thing. So we get out there and I said, do you have any tanks, big water tanks? Mm -hmm. uh, no. We're going to have to, well, we're going to have to make like a big pool or a big water tank. No, we know what a tank is. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. So I kind of draw some out from, you know, maybe like a football field mm -hmm. by half a football field. We're going to put these boats in it. We'll build the boats and make the waves. But you don't have a tank? No. Okay, so over the next four or five days, I start to think, well, we'll get some excavators. We're going to dig a tank. We're going to build some water. I start working with some kids over there, really good at um, CAD, and they start building stuff for me. And I kind of go back in, and I present to the producers and the director kind of my thought about how to get these big, beautiful wooden boats on gimbals in the water. And they go, uh, what? what are those? And I go, those are big excavators. They're going to take the go, No, we, we know what they do. They dig dirt. But why? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't understand how we're going to get a hole. I go, well, on Titanic, we actually blew holes in the ground with explosives. I guess we could do that. And they go, no, no. Um, <laughs> you don't realize where you are. And I'm like, I'm in fucking Mumbai. I mean, they go, we're, we're, we're going to give you an example. We're going to take you to a piece of property where we think we could build this tank and see if it makes sense to you. And I said, can you bring a DP? We'll do a light, uh, you know, a good light scan and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll make sure it'll all work. So we get out there and there's already a pretty big, pretty big hole, <laughs> pretty big hole in the ground. And uh, they go, so something I go, yeah, but you know, like 10 times that or 20 times that they go, yes, but we started on this yesterday. And I'm like, wow. So I look over and I literally see the crew coming back from lunch and they had shovels and buckets and hundreds of them. And what I realized is that we're going to do a version of Hollywood there. And what was inexpensive there was labor. Yeah. And the fact that I wanted to get an excavator that could take a few scoops in the time a hundred guys could do whatever, they, they thought that was insanity. What was completely sane was, I don't know what they paid those people, but they were going to dig a hole with a bucket in a big hole and they were going to do it fast and now it was pretty interesting we ended up taking the movie to malta and shooting it there so if i were considering a job in this and i'm in school or about to go to school what advice would you give me wow you know my opinion of that has changed over the years it really has i had and i'm going to say the privilege and honor to teach at, at Loyola at their film school last year. 
and have uh, students, mm -hmm. like real students, like people that paid to go to school students, probably paid a lot of money or their parents did, somebody did. And looking around that room, the very first day, um, we, we did curriculum and we did this whole thing. I wanted it perfect. And cause I didn't know if I could make everything. I had like three of my guys are gonna come help me lay out the curriculum and teach it and my assistant. And we went in there, it was like a full blown production. But what I wanted to do is ask the kids, what do they want to do? Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? I want to produce. Okay, what do you want to do? I want to direct. What do you want to do? I want to be a DP. What do you want to do? I want to produce. And we went through the whole thing, and I think there was two writers. Most were producers and directors, and there was a couple DPs. And uh, I said, I, I really don't know that I have a lot to teach you. What do you mean? I'm at a loss. I don't really know how you become a producer. <laughs> I don't think, and I'm not sure anybody in this class will ever become a director. DP, maybe, I don't know. Do you guys know what locations does? Well, yeah, they get locations. No, like, do you know what they do? Do you know what craft service does? Have you, you know, do you, do, you, do you really know what writers do? Yes, they write. They write the story. Hmm. I was like, man, I, I think what I'm gonna do is just hand out my business cards here so when you guys all become producers and writers and directors, you just fucking hire me. <laughs> I think that's the best thing I could do in this class is just give you guys my card and, Whenever you get out of school and you become rich and famous, hire me. <laughs> and I got to bond with these kids, right? Towards the end, we all, I, it, was, it was my dream to get them all to get together, to divide them into three, and we filmed a movie. Each one of them filmed a movie that we could show to the new kids coming in and would they want to take this class. And I realized that they didn't know what a fucking call sheet was. Maybe one of the kids did. Maybe one. Wow. They had no idea what a call sheet was. They, 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 they didn't, they, they didn't know even what they didn't know. And rather than teaching effects, I felt honored to actually help teach them part of life in an industry. And it was fascinating because about halfway through, and I got to bring in some of my friends, Michael T. Williamson who's an actor and a thespian at just the highest levels, probably my best friend in the whole world. And he married me actually. He's a minister and he came and married my wife and I. And uh, for any of you who don't know it, that's uh, the guy from Heat and uh, uh, The Fugitive and his most famous role was Bubba Gump. And uh, uh, at the time uh, we were teaching, he just did Fences, right? Yep. And uh, oh, he's just a fucking badass actor. So I brought a guy like him in so they could hear real English spoken in a room mm -hmm. and they could see a real gentleman actor who's been doing it since they were a child to when they were an adult, right? Grew up in the industry mm -hmm. and they could sit and talk and ask him questions. And I brought to them, to, like to, to Tobias, a real DP, come from the trenches and camera yeah. assistant all the way to, uh, oh God, you know, some of the biggest movies in Hollywood, right? So I brought these people in and let them talk to them. And it was interesting about halfway through when one of them goes, uh, so what's this set dressing thing? How does props work? You know, they came to take an effects class and um, towards the end, they're like, we better figure it out because I, I just assigned to you guys, you're each gonna do this movie. You're gonna have to be your own producers. You're gonna have to figure out how to get the materials. You're also gonna have to figure out how to get location permits. You're gonna have to figure out how to hire all these positions. You know, um, there's, there's real work to be done here. Creative is, well, that'll happen at some point, but mm -hmm. we got real work to do. Absolutely. And it was so cool to watch them all come together, you know, to watch that class come together. It's great. I want to do it again. It's just really time consuming. You're doing it now. Yeah. All you gotta do is watch. Yeah, it's cool. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you.